Welcome to the lecture on painting of the early Italian Renaissance. Still another way that the College Board has made your life as students easier and our choices as teachers harder is that the required works list now only includes two early Italian Renaissance paintings, Fra Filippo Lippi's Madonna and Child with Two Angels and Botticelli's Birth of Venus. These are wonderful paintings and I look forward to looking at them in more depth with you. But I've refused to give in entirely to the College Board list, especially since the two chosen works do not display some of the most innovative and important characteristics of early Italian Renaissance painting. Sister Wendy kicked off with Masaccio, and so will I. You saw this painting in her lecture the very first day of this unit. So, what elements of this painting's form show Giotto's influence and which show Masaccio's movement beyond the Proto-Renaissance? Like Giotto, Masaccio uses a figure with his back to us to draw the viewer into the painting. Really, the man in the orange doublet with bare legs is a stand-in for us, the viewer. The fully modeled figure, like Giotto's, have volume and weight and are further defined by shading and chiaroscuro. But now we're seeing more musculature. The bare legs help. Both the Giotto painting and the Masaccio painting use atmospheric perspective. Objects further away are blurrier, softer in value, and bluer, but Masaccio's gradations are subtler and more realistic. He is taking nature as his model. But still, this isn't the really big difference. What do you think it might be? Tribute Money is one of the earliest paintings to employ mathematical perspective. Masaccio was a close friend of Brunelleschi's, and he knew his studies of mathematical one-point perspective very well. Note how the orthogonals, those again are the lines of sight leading to a vanishing point, converge on Christ's head. And as the bottom close-up of some of the faces reveals, Masaccio also made far more use of contrasts of light and dark to define volume and space. You remember the term for this, right? You saw a similar illustration in your textbook. Here's another famous Masaccio painting. We see God the Father holding up God the Son with God the Spirit as a somewhat hard to see dove on Christ's head. The viewer's eye is drawn up to the figures of the Trinity, but also down to the skeleton or memento mori below the figures, which served as a reminder of the inevitability of death. What appears to be a deep recess in the space, and is in fact entirely a pictorial illusion, draws the viewer into the scene and therefore into communion with the triune God. The perspectival composition of this painting is extraordinarily accurate and extraordinarily complex. Note that the composition is based on a series of triangles, itself a representation of the Trinity. Also note that the patrons are larger than the figures of Mary and John at the base of the cross. Since they are closer to us in space, they should be larger, but clearly they are not more important than the three persons of the Trinity or Mary and John. In other words, optical naturalism is replacing conceptual representation. And finally, we get to a required work. <clears throat> if you made time to watch the extra credit Medici video, you know that the monk who painted this work was not as angelic as Fra Angelico, and for that matter, his angels aren't as angelic either. Some art historians think that the angel on the bottom right, who's looking out at us with that impish smile, is actually Lippi's son with the nun he ran off with, a boy who grew up to be another famous Renaissance painter, a Filipino Lippi. Indeed, the model for the Madonna may well have been Filipino's mother, Lucretia, although neither of these identifications has been confirmed. So what's happened to the halo? It has almost disappeared and soon will disappear altogether as Renaissance artists pursue more naturalism. So how would you compare this Giotto, excuse me, how would you compare this to Giotto's Madonna and Child on the right? Both of these figures have weight and substance. If anything, Giotto's Mary has the more obvious physical form. But this Mary and baby, that means Lippi's Mary and baby, are even more human and also more sensual. Lippi's Mary has a more secular beauty and setting. Look at the huge pearl over her finely dressed hair and the string of pearls receding in a striking triangle from her high forehead. She sits on an ornate piece of furniture in a gray stone window through which we see cultivated fields, soaring rocks, and a distant city. 
This is crucial to the painting's intimacy because it brings the Madonna forward into our own space. So does the way the image is cropped to spill out of the frame. Mary's shadow appears on the frame in a painting lit from the right, another physical as opposed to spiritual detail. She's placed in front of the window like an actor in the front of a stage. The realistic landscape is another Renaissance feature. Lippi was influenced by Flemish landscapes. Stay tuned. This is an identifiable Florence scene with the river Arno in the background. Again, we're seeing Renaissance naturalism. Lippi, like Masaccio, also creates the illusion of depth by employing atmospheric perspective. Objects further away appear paler, bluer than those close up, just as they do in nature. The image on the bottom right is a photograph, not a painting. Let's look quickly at a few other paintings by Lippi, both to help you in case you get hit by an attribution question. Note there was one included in the AP Classroom questions. And to tease out the formal qualities of his painting. In general, Lippi is less interested in perspective and even chiaroscuro than Masaccio, and more interested in the play of line. One reason for this, and it will turn out to be true of Botticelli as well, as we'll see in a minute, is that Lippi painted in egg tempera. Because tempera dried very quickly, it was hard to create subtle blends of color, although both Giotto and Masaccio often pulled it off. But still, the medium lends itself to crisper, clearer lines with fewer gradations of tone. These angels don't look like they're up to as much mischief as the angels in our required work, but still we see those beautiful, serene faces, elaborate hairdos, and the strong use of line, especially in the flowers. Almost all of Lippi's paintings were religious, and mostly they were of Mary, but the painting on the right is actually the earliest surviving double portrait in Italian art. Note again the strong use of line and the emphasis on the woman's luxurious clothing. High foreheads, by the way, were a sign of beauty created by careful hair plucking, ouch. None of our Italian Renaissance required works is a portrait, but in fact, the Renaissance emphasis on, the in, on individual achievement, their admiration of Roman portrait statues, and the growing patronage of a wealthy merchant class all increase the demand for portraits. You just saw a lippy example. Here are two paintings by the Florentine painter Girolandio. Note again how much individual personality even the rather austere profile portrait conveys. I love this painting and wish we could linger. Notice how the painter uses foreshortening, line, and perspective to bring order to this chaotic scene, while the diagonal spears and rhythm create, uh, create add rhythm and energy. So I'm going to end my early Renaissance painting lecture with Botticelli. This is the College Board's required work, and probably a painting you would have recognized even before you took this course. Botticelli, like Lippi, was less obsessed with perspective than some of his Florentine contemporaries. The spaces portrayed here are surprisingly flat. Some art historians think Botticelli was influenced by Greek face painting. Botticelli was another of our artists who thrived under the patronage of the Medici, in his case, Cosimo's grandson, Lorenzo the Magnificent. Several of the figures in this Botticelli painting are identifiable historic personages. The older man kneeling in front of the Virgin is Cosimo de' Medici. The arrogant young man on the left is Lorenzo the Magnificent. And the figure on the right looking out the viewer is probably Botticelli himself. Back to our Venus. The statue on the left is the Venus de' Medici, or modest Venus, a first century BCE Hellenistic copy of a classical Greek original, perhaps a work by Praxiteles, and one of the Medici family's prized possessions. Notice a resemblance? Botticelli was clearly sucking up to his patrons, who had a deep interest in the classical world. Lorenzo the Magnificent had, in fact, commissioned a verse form of Hesiod's account of Venus's birth. So this was an important story to this very important patron. And it's quite a story. According to Hesiod, Cronus cut off Uranus's genitals and cast them into the sea. The foam symbolizes his semen. Aphrodite, or Venus, was born fully grown from that foam. She rested on a shell until she drifted to a shore blown by the zephyrs, or winds, that you see on the left. When she arrived, she was greeted by one of the three graces who covered her up properly. So what made this content so innovative and a little shocking? 
Mythological subjects were popular in literature, but they were just starting to make a comeback in art. Botticelli spearheaded this movement, and he also used mythological scenes as an excuse to explore the female nude. This was the first monumental female nude of a pagan goddess since Roman times, although not the first female nude. Eve got to show up in paintings without her clothes, which may account for some of the popularity of this theme in religious art. The use of canvas was innovative as well. Previously, this material had been used mostly for parade banners. Actually, this painting's original function may have been as a banner in one of Florence's many festive parades, perhaps in honor of a wedding. To add a historical note, I can't resist, this painting disappeared into obscurity almost immediately, along with Botticelli's reputation. When Napoleon ransacked the Italian collections in the early 19th century, he didn't even bother to steal any Botticelli's. In 1815, after the Napoleonic Wars, the painting was moved from the Medici Palace to the Uffizi, but it wasn't considered one of the museum's major works. Botticelli only regained popularity at the end of the 19th century, when artistic taste came back around to Botticelli's particular vision of female beauty. So what would you know about the painting's form or style? Let's practice a little visual description. I'm struck by how much motion there is in this painting. The outflung cloak, the blowing hair, the zephyrs alighting on the shore. Like Lippi, Botticelli relied heavily on line and pattern. Note the exquisite detailing of the plants and the rhythmic patterns of the clothing and the shell. Botticelli's colors are vibrant but soft. The values in the painting are not high. And while the receding sea and small boat create a horizon and a sense of space, we don't see the kind of technical show-off perspective of, say, Masaccio's works. So let's look at a few other Botticelli's, more attribution practice. This painting, along with the birth of Venus and Primavera, which we'll see in a moment, are sometimes referred to as furniture paintings or even bedroom paintings. They were private paintings intended for the bedroom. The long, narrow shape fit easily over a bed. The two portraits below are of Simonetta Vespucci, considered the greatest beauty of her age. Recognize her as, probably, the Venus in this painting and the birth of Venus. Mars, by the way, may have been modeled after young Giuliano de' Medici. And here's one of Botticelli's most famous bedroom paintings. Note that these last three paintings have all addressed mythological themes. And again, we see a strong focus on line and pattern. But, of course, Botticelli painted religious themes as well. Most of the market was for religious art. You remember his Judith from our first week of class? And I love this Madonna and child, but I'd hate to be asked whether the painter was Botticelli or his teacher, who was Filippo Lippi. The Botticelli story does not end happily. At the end of the 15th century, a Dominican friar, Savonarola, attracted huge crowds with sermons warning Florentines that they were heading to hell if they did not abandon their materialistic ways and especially their wicked art, and his timing was terrific. In 1494, the King of France invaded Italy, seeming to fulfill Savonarola's prophecies of doom. At the monks' urgings, the Florentines expelled the ruling Medici, established a popular republic, and set out to destroy wicked works of literature and art in huge bonfires, the so-called bonfires of the vanities. Botticelli became a follower of Savonarola. He may or may not have burned some of his paintings in the bonfire. The record on this isn't clear, but he did paint this scene from Greek history of an innocent youth being attacked by slander. This may have been Botticelli's defense of Savonarola, who was eventually ex executed for slandering the Pope. The second part of the Medici video has a terrific account of this episode. I hope some of you watched it. And now we head north and back in time again to the splendid works of the Northern Renaissance.